Welcome to my channel. This is Captain Binoy Varagil, Assistant Professor, Department of English, St. Joseph's College, Dev Green, Kodakot. We continue our discussion of the history of the English language. This is the third lecture in this series, and today we are discussing the early history of English language. And in this section, we look at the languages in England before English. We are so accustomed to thinking of English as an inseparable adjunct to the English people that we are likely to forget that it has been the language of England for a comparatively short period in the world's history. Since its introduction into the island, the middle of the 5th century, it had a career extending through only 1,500 years. Yet this part of the world had been inhabited by humans for thousands of years, 50,000 according to more moderate estimates, 250,000 in opinion of some. During this long stretch of time, most of it dimly visible through prehistoric myths, the presence of a number of cultures can be detected, and each of these cultures had a language. Nowhere does our knowledge of the history of humankind carry us back to a time when humans did not have a language. What can be said about the early languages of England? Unfortunately, little enough. What we know of the earliest inhabitants of England is derived wholly from the material remains that have been uncovered by archaeological research. The classification of these inhabitants is consequently based upon the types of material culture that characterize them in their successive stages. Before the discovery of metals, human societies were dependent upon stone for the fabrication of such implements and weapons as they possess. Generally speaking, the Stone Age is thought to have lasted in England until about 2000 BC, although the English were still using some stone weapons in the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Stone, however, gradually gave way to bronze as bronze was eventually displaced by iron about 500 or 600 BC. Because the Stone Age was of long duration, it's customary to distinguish between an earlier and a later period known as the Paleolithic Old Stone Age and the Neolithic New Stone Age. Paleolithic humans, the earliest inhabitants of England, entered at a time when this part of the world formed a part of the continent of Europe, when there was no English Channel and when the North Sea was not much more than an enlarged river basin. The people of this period were short of stature, averaging about five feet long-armed and short-legged, with low foreheads and poorly developed chins. They lived in the open, under rock shelters or, later, in caves. They were dependent for food upon the vegetation that grew wild and such animals as they could capture and kill. Fortunately, an abundance of fish and game materially lessen the problem of existence. Their weapons scarcely extended beyond a primitive sledge or axe, to which they eventually learned to affix a handle. More than one distinct group is likely to be represented in the early stage of culture. The humans whose 
remains are found in the latest paleo Paleolithic strata are distinguished by a high degree of the walls of a high degree of artistic skill. But representations of boar and master den on pieces of bone or the walls of caves tell us nothing about the language of their designers. The language disappeared with the disappearance of the race or their absorption into the later population. We know nothing about the language or languages of Paleolithic culture. Neolithic is likewise a convenient rather than scientific term to designate the peoples who from about 5000 BC possesses a superior kind of stone implement, often polished and a higher culture generally. The predominant type in this new population appears to have come from the south and from its widespread distribution in the lands bordering on the Mediterranean is known as the Mediterranean race. It was a dark race of slightly larger stature than the Paleolithic population. The people of this technologically more advanced culture had domesticated the common domestic animals and developed elementary agriculture. They made crude pottery and did a little weaving and some lived in granogs, structures built on pilings driven into the swamps and lakes. They buried their dead, covering the more important members of society with large mounds or barrows, oval in shape. But they did not have the artistic gifts of late Paleolithic people. The language has not sure survived. Their language has not survived. And because our hope of learning anything about the language they spoke rests upon of finding somewhere a remnant of the race still speaking that language, that hope, so far as England is concerned, is dead. In a corner of the Pyrenees mountains of Spain, however, there survives a small community that is believed by some to represent this non-Indo-European culture. These people are the Basque and their language shows no affiliation with any other language now known. Allowing for the changes it has doubtless undergone through the centuries, the Basque language may fin furnish us with a clue to the language of at least one group in the Neolithic culture of Europe. The first people in England about whose language we have definite knowledge are the Celts. It used to be assumed that the coming of the Celtic to England coincided with the introduction of bronze into the island. But the use of bronze probably preceded the Celts by several centuries. We have already described the Celtic languages in England and called attention to the two divisions of them, the Gaelic or Goidelic branch and the Brythonic branch. Celtic was probably the first Indo-European tongue to be spoken in England. One other language, Latin, was spoken rather extensively for a period of about four centuries before the coming of English. Latin was introduced when Britain became a province of the Roman Empire because this was an event that has left a significant mark upon later history. It will be well to consider it separately. Now let us look at Romans in Britain.
In the summer of 55 BC, Julius Caesar, having completed the conquest of Gaul, decided upon an invasion of England. What the object of his enterprise was is not known for certain. It is unlikely that he contemplated the conquest of the island. Probably his chief purpose was to discourage the Celts of Britain from coming to the assistance of Celts in Gaul. Should the latter attempt to throw off the Roman York, the expedition that year almost ended disastrously and his return the following year was not a great success. In crossing the channel, some of his transports encountered a storm that deprived him of the support of his cavalry. The resistance of the Celts was unexpectedly spirited. It was with difficulty that he effected a landing and he made little headway because the season was far advanced. He soon returned to Gaul. The expedition had resulted in no material gain and some loss of prestige. Accordingly, the following summer, he again invaded the island. After much more elaborate preparation, this time he succeeded in establishing himself in the southeast but after a few encounters with the Celts, in which he was moderately successful, he exacted tribe from them, which was never paid, and again returned to Gaul. He had perhaps succeeded in his purpose, but he had by no means struck terror into the hearts of the Celts, and Britain was not again troubled by Roman legions for nearly a hundred years. The Roman Conquest It was in AD 43 that the Roman Emperor Claudius decided to undertake the actual conquest of the island. With the knowledge of Caesar's experience behind him, he did not underestimate the problems involved. Accordingly, an army of 40,000 was sent to Britain and within three years had subjugated the people of the central and southeastern regions. Subsequent campaigns soon brought almost all of what is now England under Roman rule. The progress of Roman control was not uninterrupted. A serious uprising of the Celts occurred in AD 61 under Bodica, Boadicea, the widow of one of the Celtic chiefs, and 70,000 Romans and Romanized Britons are said to have been massacred. Under the Roman governor Agricola, AD 78 to 85, the northern frontier was advanced to the Solway and the Tyne, and the conquest may be said to have been completed. The Romans never penetrated far into the mountains of Wales and Scotland. Eventually, they protected the northern boundary by a stone wall stretching across England at approximately the limits of Agricola's permanent conquest. The district south of this time, this line, was under Roman rule for more than 300 years. Now let's understand the Romanization of the island. It was inevitable that the military conquest of Britain should have been followed by the Romanization of the province, where the Romans lived and ruled. Their Roman ways were found. Four great highways soon spread fan-like from London to the north, the northwest, the west, and the southwest, while the fifth cut across the island from Lincoln to the seven 
numerous lesser roads connected important military or civil centers or branched off as spurs from the main highways. A score of small cities and more than a hundred towns with their Roman houses and baths, temples and occasional theaters testify to the introduction of Roman habits of life. The houses were equipped with heating apparatus and water stuck water supply. They, their floors were paved in mosaic and their walls were of painted stucco. All, as in their Italian counterparts, Roman dress, Roman ornaments and utensils and Roman pottery and glassware seemed to have been in general use. By the 3rd century, Christianity had made some progress in the island. And in AD 314, bishops from London and York attended a church council in Gaul. Under the relatively peaceful conditions that existed everywhere except along the frontiers, where the hostile penetration of the unconquered population was always to be feared, there is every reason to think that Romanization had preceded very much as it had in the other provinces of the empire. The difference is that in Britain the progress was cut short in the 5th century. Now we look at Latin language in Britain. Among the other evidences of Romanization must be included the use of the Latin language. A great number of inscriptions have been found, all of them in Latin. The majority of these proceed, no doubt, from the military and official class, and being in the nature of public records, where, therefore, the official language they do not in themselves indicate a widespread use of Latin by the native population. Latin did not replace the Celtic language in Britain as it did in Gaul. Its use by native Britons was probably confined to members of the upper classes and some inhabitants of the cities and towns. Occasional graffiti scratched on a tile or a piece of pottery apparently by the worker who made it suggests that in some localities Latin was familiar to the artisan class. Outside the cities there were many fine country houses, some of which were probably occupied by the well-to-do. The occupants of these also probably spoke Latin. Tacitus tells us that in the time of Agricola, the Britons, who had hitherto shown only hostility to the language of their conquerors, now became eager to speak it. At about the same time, a Greek teacher from Asia Minor was teaching in Britain, and by AD 96, the poet Martial was able to boss, possibly with some exaggeration, that his works were read even in this far off island. On the whole, there were certainly many people in the Roman Britain who habitually spoke Latin or upon occasion could use it, but its use was not sufficiently widespread to cause it to survive. As the Celtic language survived the upheaval of the Germanic invasions, its use probably began to decline after 410, the approximate date at which the last of the Roman legions were officially withdrawn from the island. The few traces that it has left in the language of the Germanic invaders and that can still be seen in the English language today will occupy us later. Now let's look at the German Germanic conquests 
and the consequences. About the year 449, an event occurred that profoundly affected the course of history. In that year, as traditionally stated, began the invasion of Britain by certain Germanic tribes, the founders of the English nation. For more than a hundred years, bands of conquerors and settlers migrated from their continental homes in the regions of Denmark and the Low Countries and established themselves in the south and east of the island, gradually extending the area they occupied until it included all but the highlands in the west and north. The events of these years are wrapped in much obscurity. Although we can form a general idea of their cause, we are still in doubt about some of the tribes that took part in the movement, their exact location on the continent and the dates of their respective migrations. The traditional account of the Germanic invasion goes back to Beard and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Bede in his ecclesiastical history of the English people, completed in 731, tells us that the Germanic tribes that conquered England were the Jews, Saxons and Angles. From what he says and from England, from what he says and from other indications, it seems possible that the Jews and the Angles had their home in the Danish peninsula, the Jews, in the northern half, hence the name J Jude land, and the Angles in the south, in Schleswig Holstein, and perhaps a small area at the base. The Saxons were settled to the south and west of the Angles, roughly between the LB and the M's, possibly as far as the Rhine. A fourth tribe, the Frisians, some of whom almost certainly came to England, occupied a narrow strip along the coast from the Weser to the Rhine, together with the islands opposite. By the time of the invasions, the Jews had apparently moved down to the coastal area near the mouth of the Weser and possibly also around the Zuider Zee and the Lower Rhine, thus being in contact with both the Frisians and the Saxons. Britain had been ex exposed to attacks by the Saxons from as early as the 4th century. Even while the island was under Roman rule, these attacks had become sufficiently serious to necessitate the appointment of an officer known as the Count of the Saxon Shore, whose duty it was to police the southeastern coast. At the same time, the unconquered Picts and Scots in the north were kept out only at the price of constant vigilance. Against both of these sources of attack, the Roman organization seems to have proved adequate. But the Celts had come to depend on Roman arms for this protection. They had, moreover, under Roman influence settled down to a more peaceful mode of life, and their military traditions had lapsed. Consequently, when the Romans withdrew in 410, the Celts found themselves at a disadvantage. They were no longer able to keep out the warlike Picts and Scots. Several times they called upon Rome for aid, but finally the Romans, fully occupied in defending their own territory at home, were forced to refuse assistance. It was on this occasion that Vortigern, one of the Celtic leaders, is reported to have entered into an agreement with the Jews, whereby 
they were to assist the Celts in driving out the pigs and scouts and to receive as their reward the Isle of Thane on the northeastern tip of Kent. The Jews, who had not been softened by contact with Roman civilization, were fully a match for the pigs and scouts. But what again and the Celts soon found that they had in these temporary allies something more serious to reckon with than their northern enemies. The Jews, having recognized the weakness of the Britons, decided to stay in the island and began making a forcible settlement in the southeast in Kent. The settlement of the Jews was a very different thing from the conquest of the island by the Romans. The Romans had come to rule the Celtic population, not to dispossess it. The Jews came in numbers and settled on the island, on the lands of the Celts. They met the res resistance of the Celts by driving them out. Moreover, the example of the Jews was soon followed by the migration of other continental tribes. According to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, some of the Saxons came in 477, landed on the south coast and established themselves in Sussex. In 495, further bands of Saxons settled a little to the west in Wessex. Finally, in the middle of the next century, the Angles occupied the east coast and in 547 established an Anglian kingdom north of the Humber River. Too much credence, of course, cannot be put in these statements or dates. There were Saxon north of the Thames as the names Essex and Middle Essex, the districts of the East Saxon and Middle Saxons, indicate and the Angles had already begun to settle in East Anglia by the end of the 5th century. But the entries, but the entries in the chronicle may, may be taken as indicating in a general way a succession of settlements extending over more than a century which completely changed the character of the island of Britain. Now we look at the Anglo-Saxon civilization. It's difficult to speak with surety about the relations of the newcomers and the native population. In some districts where the inhabitants were few, the Anglo-Saxons probably settled down beside the Celts in more or less peaceful contact. In others, as in West Saxon territory, the invaders met with stubborn resistance and succeeded in establishing themselves only after much fighting. Many of the Celts undoubtedly many of the Celts undoubtedly were driven into the West and sought refuge in Wales and Cornwall, and some emigrated across the Channel to Brittany. In any case, such civilization as had been attained under Roman influence was largely destroyed. The Roman towns were burned and abandoned. Town life did not attract the population used to life in the open and finding its occupation in hunting and agriculture. The Organization of society was by families and clans with a sharp distinction between eols, a kind of hereditary aristocracy, and the seols, or simple freemen. The business of the community was transacted in local assemblies or moods. The justice was administered through a series of fines the Virgil, which were varied according to the nature of the crime and the rank of 
the injured party. Guilt was generally determined by ordeal or by combagation. In time, powerful, in, in time, various tribes combined either for greater strength or under the influence of a powerful leader to produce small kingdoms. Seven of these are eventually recognized. Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia, Kent, Essex, Sussex, and Wessex, and are spoken of as the Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy. But the grouping was not very permanent, sometimes two or more being united under one king, at other times kingdoms being divided under separate rulers, in the early part of the 7th century, Northumbria gained political supremacy over a number of the other kingdoms and held an undoubted leadership in literature and uh, learning as well. In the 8th century, this leadership passed to Mercia. Finally, in the 9th century, Wessex, under the guidance of Egbert, between 802 and 839 began to extend its influence until 830 all England including the chieftains of Wales acknowledged Egbert's overlordship the result can hardly be called a united kingdom but West Saxon kings were able to maintain their claim to be kings of all the English, and under Alfred 871 to 889, Wessex attained a high degree of prosperity and considerable enlightenment. Now let us look at how the names England and English originated. The Celts called their Germanic conquerors Saxons indiscriminately, probably because they had had their first contact with the Germanic people through the Saxon raids on the coast. Early Latin writers following Celtic usage generally called the Germanic inhabitants of England Saxons and the land Saxonia, but soon the terms Angli and Anglia occur beside Saxons and refer not to the Angles individually, but to the West Germanic tribes generally. Ethelbert, King of Kent, is styled Rex Anglorum by Pope Gregory in 601, and a century later, Bede called his history the Historia Ecclesiastica. Gentis Anglorum. In time, Angli and Anglia become the usual terms in Latin texts. From the beginning, however, writers in the vernacular never called their language anything but English. The word is derived from the name of the Angles, Old English Angle, but is used without distinction for the language of all the invading tribes. In like manner, the land and its people are called Anglesin, Anglekin or race of the Angles. And this is the common name until after the Danish period. From about the year 1000, Ingla land, land of the Angles, begins to take its place. The name English is thus older than the name England. It is not easy to say why England should have taken its name from the Angles, possibly a desire to avoid confusion with the Saxons who remained on the continent and the early supremacy of the Anglian kingdoms were the predominant factors in determining usage. Now we look at the origin and position of English. The English language of today is the language that has resulted from the history of the dialects spoken by the Germanic tribes who came to England in the manner 
prescribed. It is impossible to say how much the speech of the Angles differed from that of the Saxons or that of the Jews. The differences were certainly slight. Even after these dialects had been subjected to several centuries of geographical and political separation in England, the differences were not great. As we have seen above, English belongs to the low West Germanic branch of the Indo-European family. This means, in the first place, that it shares certain characteristics common to all the Germanic languages. For example, it shows the shifting of certain consonants described above under the head of Grimm's Low. It possesses a weak as well as a strong declension of the adjective and a distinctive type of conjugation of the verb, the so-called weak or regular verbs such as fill, filled, fill, which form their past tense and past participle by adding ed or some analogous sounds to the stem of the present. And it shows the adoption of a strong stress accent on the first or the root syllable of most words, a feature of great importance in all the Germanic languages because it is chiefly responsible for the progressive decay of inflections in these languages. In the second place, it means that English belongs with German and certain other languages because of features it has in common with them and that enable us to distinguish a West Germanic group as contrasted with the Scandinavian languages, North Germanic and Gothic East Germanic. These features have to do mostly with certain phonetic changes, especially the gemination of doubling of consonants under special conditions matters that we do not need to enter upon here. And it means finally that English along with the other languages of the northern Germany and the low countries do not participate in the further modification of certain consonants known as the second or high German sound shift. In other words, it belongs with the dialects of the lowlands in the West Germanic area. Now we look at uh, the periods in the history of English. The evolution of English in the 1500 years of its existence in England has been an unbroken one. Within this development, however, it is possible to recognize three main periods. Like all divisions in history, the periods of the English language are matters of convenience and the dividing lines between them purely arbitrary. But within each of the periods, it is possible to recognize certain broad characteristics and certain special developments that take place. The period from 450 to 1150 is known as Old English. It is sometimes described as the period of full inflections because during most of this period, the endings of the noun, the adjective and the verb are preserved more or less unimpaired. From 1150 to 1500, the language is known as Middle English. During this period, the inflections which had begun to break down toward the end of the Old English period become greatly reduced and it is consequently known as the period of level inflections. The language since 1500 is called modern English. By the time we reach this stage in the development of the large part of the original inflection, the original inflectional system had disappeared entirely and we therefore speak of it as the period of lost inflections. The progressive decay of the inflections is only one of the developments that mark 
the evolution of English in its various stages. We shall discuss in their proper place the other features that are characteristic of Old English, Middle English and Modern English. So with this we come to the end of the lecture on the yearly history of English language. And in this lecture we looked at uh, the different inhabitants of the British Isles on one side and the other side we looked at the different languages that came to the British Isles. And when we discussed the different early inhabitants and languages, we understood the fact that English is a mixture of different foreign languages. And uh, towards the end of our lecture, we came across the Germanic tribes, Angles, Saxons and Jews entering the British Isles and slowly the name of the island is becoming England. And in the subsequent lecture, in the next lecture, that is lecture number four, we'll be looking at the dialects of Old English period. In the subsequent lectures, we are just going to discuss the Old English period, features of Old English period, the Middle English period, features of Middle English period. And in lecture number four, that is next lecture, we discuss the dialects of Old English period, so also the features of Old English. Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you.